Greetings, Centerpoint Church and friends. My name is John. I'm lead pastor here, and I'm glad that we could be together this weekend for Church Online. And I want to especially welcome those of you who've never been with us before. I'm so glad you found us and, and joined us. And we're going to do three things today in this, uh, in this message. And, and I want to begin this way. You know, this past week, the last week of May 2020, has been marked by a lot of, a lot of uh, ugliness and difficulty and pain for a lot of people. And right now, I want to speak only for myself. I don't want to presume to speak for anyone, but if you regard me as your pastor, or if you would allow me to speak with a pastoral voice to you for just a moment, I think we need to acknowledge some things. I think most of us would agree that we saw something uh, in the news this week in the death of George Floyd that uh, is a horrific injustice. Most of us would at least see that. But the thing is, for a great many more people, it's more than just an injustice out there, over there somewhere. For a lot of people this week, uh, maybe in particular people not like me, what, what took place wasn't just out there and over there somewhere, it was personal. And it was felt as something deeply personal, deeply painful. And while people like me might not be able to understand why that is, that is the reality. And in a moment like this, I think we need to be able to stop for a second and just acknowledge that. And you know what? What is needed in a moment like this is resistance. And here's what I mean. We need to be able to resist the tendencies that we might in our flesh kind of come to a moment like this with. First, let me just say it like this. Some of us, maybe people like me, need to resist the tendency to say, well, yeah, that was an injustice, but, I mean, it, once you add that but, well, you've missed the point. Uh, people like me, we need to, to resist the tendency to say something like, well, uh, that, uh, you know, that might have been wrong, but these riots are wrong. If we skip too quickly, right over the pain, we have missed the mark of love. Or, or, or some of us, we need to resist the tendency to say, well, this wasn't a race issue, because that's easy for some of us to say, while for a whole lot of other people, it very much feels like a race issue, and there's a lot of pain and here's what I'm learning in my life, that when there's a lot of pain, and if I have a heart to come to that pain with the hope of bringing something that might look like healing, the first step has got to be empathy, at the very least. And empathy in this moment would look like saying to, to people not like me, it might look like saying, I see your pain. I might not fully understand it, and maybe I never could but I see it. And maybe even a step further would be to say, I see the pain that you're experiencing. Help me understand it better. I mean, wouldn't that kind of a humble, empathetic posture give more likelihood that we could move towards something like healing than standing with our arms folded and saying, this isn't a race issue. All lives matter. I mean, if we do that, we're jumping right over the pain and moving the needle further in the feeling of injustice that a lot of people are living with right now. So again, I'm speaking only for myself, but I hope that you'd hear me. And if you regard me as your pastor or as a pastoral voice that you might respect, would you join me in resisting the tendency that I just mentioned? Now, for some people on the other side of the equation, there might need to be a, a resistance also to resist the tendency to say, are you kidding me? Do you actually need me to tell you why there's pain in my community right now? Yeah. I'm praying that we would each and all take a step towards the healing that I think is desperately needed in a moment like this. So my, maybe we could just take a moment right now, just while we're getting started together and pray over this. Would you pray with me? God, I'm pleading for your mercy to come into each one of us in this moment. God, I pray that you would forgive people like me that have too quickly stepped into a place of, uh, of pride or, or a lack of empathy or a lack of love or a lack of being able to feel other people's pain. God, forgive us for that. 
God, I'm taking it even a step further and I'm praying, Lord, that you would forgive us for, as a nation for the historical weight of injustice against a whole community that is still resonating. And God, I'm praying now that your mercy would come and that there would be more and more of us that would choose to say, okay, I'm going to resist my tendencies to, to get all in the flesh about this, but instead I'm going to step forward with empathy. God, I pray you'd raise that up in so many of us, more empathy, a willingness to say, I see your pain. I don't understand it. Help me understand it. And God, I pray that in those moments, little moments, one after another, God, you'd bring some healing. If not out in the world at large, at least in a few particular relationships and personal moments. God, we're asking for your mercy to come. And there's so much more that needs to be said about this, so much more that it needs to be conveyed. But in this moment, God, I'm asking at least for that, for uh, more, more empathy, more empathy, more empathy in the movement towards healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This, uh, this weekend, I'm beginning a message series called The Resistance. And I believe that it's important that we understand some things. It seems to me, and you've probably seen it as well, that there is a current in the world around us that kind of moves in, in a direction that a lot of times it, it seems to be empowered by and actually is empowered by evil. And because that's the reality, there need to be some people who know what it means to come in the opposite direction with a counter current to that direction that is characterized by evil. And so in this series, The Resistance, I'm asking you to recognize that that's where you come in. That you are designed by God to be the one that steps into that, that current, that stream of, of hatred and division and strife and evil and comes in the opposite spirit, the spirit of God and with the power and love of God to tear down the influences of the evil and, and evil structures that are empowered by the devil. And so that's what this series, The Resistance, is about. And I think God is looking for some people to be a part of that resistance. And so I want you to turn to First Peter chapter 5 right now. Uh, turn to First Peter chapter 5. There's so many places in the scripture that describe this reality of evil and then also describe the opportunity that there is for those of us who know the love and power of God to rise up in that power and love to do something about that evil. And so we're going to turn today just for a moment to First Peter 5, but I want you to know that it's going to take me about 10 weeks to fully break into this, this subject in the resistance. Uh, and so I want you to turn there now with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. And just jump in at verse 8. This is what we read there. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Okay, so this series, The Resistance, is one in which we're going uh, to be diving into what God's word has to say about the reality of the supernatural, about angels, about demons, about the devil, about the place of God's people and having power to do something about uh, the evil in this world. That is where we're going in this series. And it's important for you to take it all in. I'm especially excited if this is all kind of new for you. If being part of a church experience is new for you, it is crucial that you would understand that there is an unseen reality. And at all times, this unseen reality is exerting an influence. And what God's design is, is for people that come in the name of Jesus to rise up with the power of that name and bring light into every place where there's currently darkness. And so, believer, I'm asking you to come into a place today where you would wake up and that you would come into that place of resisting the evil that would otherwise have such a strong current in this world. You are part of God's solution. You are part of how God is bringing goodness and love into and against that current of evil. You are God's plan. You are 
the resistance. And this scripture is part of what we've got to take to heart uh, together. Again, in First, first Peter, oh, let, first let me just share with you the main idea of my message. The main idea of this message is a resolve that I hope that you would uh, make personal. And it's just simply this. I've been raised up with Jesus. And so I can and will resist the devil. Why don't you just say that out loud one time with me? Say it. I've been raised up with Jesus, so I can and will resist the devil. Say it again. I've been raised up with Jesus, so I can and will resist the devil. Okay, so again, back to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says... Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know what? The truth is, you probably don't need me to prove to you that there's evil in this world. I mean, all you had to do was turn on the news this week and, and the strife, the tension, the shadows of it all are unmistakable. They're right there. And it's not just because there's a whole lot of people grumpy out there. I mean, it's true. There are a whole lot of people grumpy, but this is way more than that. Uh, there's an insidious backdrop in, in these moments, and it is these moments that make it more clear than ever that there really is darkness and evil in this world. And the scriptures reveal that that's not uh, just nebulous, but that instead that there is one who's regarded as your adversary, that's what the scripture says. Another translation, this one says, your enemy. And so that's the language of the Bible. That's not me. That's what God's saying about how we ought to understand things. That there is an adversary, there is an enemy, and it's the devil. You could just go ahead and say out loud, the devil. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the devil. The devil is uh, an adversary, your enemy, prowling around, roaring like a lion, looking for someone to devour. Do you remember the headline in October 2019? No, of course you don't remember the headline in October 2019. That was like 11 years ago, or at least it feels that way. But there was this headline in October 2019. It said, woman, you know, jumps into the zoo enclosure at the Bronx Zoo. And just the headline, it was kind of like, why in the world would she do that? And there was a bunch of footage of this woman inside of the the lion enclosure, the Bronx Zoo, and later after she was detained <laughs> and, and pulled aside, people asked her, why did you do that? Why did you go into the lion enclosure? And she said, I just wanted to tell those lions that I loved them. What are you talking about? You don't mess around with lions. You just don't. And you don't mess around with the devil either. I mean, I think I want to take to heart what God's word is saying. God's word doesn't say, ah, don't worry about that you know, silly little pussycat. God's word says, no, no, no. Be alert. Watch out. Another translation says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion and he's not looking just to purr up against someone. It said he's looking for someone to devour. And, it, and I'm not gonna make light of that. I wanna take that for what it is and understand what God has called me to do for starters. With regards to the devil, the scripture doesn't say, be very afraid, It doesn't say, be terrified, none of that, no. But it is very specific what God calls us to do. It starts by saying, be alert or be watchful. Another translation says, be vigilant. If you got a friend named Gregory, his word shows up, uh, his name shows up right here. The word in the original text is, is Gregory Sate. <laughs> and the, word, the name Gregory comes from that, you know, being vigilant, watchful. It, it means to give strict attention to, to be actively cautious about, to be vigilant and watching with alertness lest you be overtaken. And the root word of that word is the word wake up. Wake up. It's like God is saying, you need to wake up to the reality that the, the, the enemy is real and you don't need to get uh, tramp, trampled by the enemy. You need to wake up. Some of us need a spiritual awakening in this moment. You know, there's a, a guy from the 1500s 
named uh, Ignatius of Loyola. And he's, you know, a saint in the Catholic tradition. And, but e- even for most Christians, there's a, a respect for this guy, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, because uh, he founded the Jesuits and, and gave insight into how to walk in real intimacy with Jesus and live a, a full and powerful spiritual life. But you know what? This guy, Ignatius, he started out his life as just a rich young guy over there in Loyola in Spain, and he was the original partier of his day, and he was known for just being a, a, you know, a party guy, nothing but. And what happened was he was building his life on power, on privilege, on prestige, and, but then he had to go off to war. And he had to fight against the French, and he was on the battlefield, and he got hit by a cannonball. And the cannonball shattered his knee and broke his other leg, and he ended up in the hospital for a year. And it was after getting hit by a cannonball and being in the hospital for a year that he had some time to think about some things. And it was in that time of having been hit by a cannonball that he was He was waking up spiritually to the reality of who God really is and what his life really meant and what he was really made for. And it was much more than just power and privilege and partying. He woke up when that cannonball hit him. And you know what? Sometimes it takes a cannonball hitting somebody for that spiritual awakening to happen. What if what's been taking place over the last couple months was a bit of a cannonball experience for some of us. Because we're not actually being hit by a cannonball, but we're being hit by a crisis. But I'm praying and hoping that it will be a wake-up call for every one of us, a wake-up call to the reality of who God is, the wake-up call to how good God is, how much we need his power and love in our life, and a wake-up call to just the reality of evil and that There need to be people of God who stand up against the reality of evil and take our stand against the enemy and who enter into being the resistance and doing what the scriptures say, to be watchful, to be alert, to be, as another translation says, sober-minded. This is what we are made for. First Peter says that we ought to be watchful because this This devil is set on destroying and devouring people, believers in particular, and all of humanity by extension. But God's call is for you and I to be alert. But not only to be alert and watching, but also to do what comes next. In verse 9, it said, resist him. Somebody say, resist him. To resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Resist him. This is God's call for us. Resist him. I want you to look at at verse 9 again, and I want you to read it out loud with me. Just the first few words. Ready? Just the first few words. Say it. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Say it again. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Say it this time, but add the words, I will, at the, at the top of it. Would you say it? I will resist him, standing firm in the faith. Say it again like that. I will resist him, standing firm in the faith. Say it again. I will resist him, standing firm in the faith. I, I will. That's my resolve in this message today. I'm hoping that you would resolve with me to say, I will resist the devil. I've been raised up with Jesus so I can and will resist the devil. We're called to do this. You know, when uh, the rain finally stopped uh, about a month and a half ago, it was time to mow the lawn. And we got the lawnmower out. It wouldn't work. I ended up taking it to uh, the lawnmower replay, repair place in Lake Elsinore, and they fixed it. 120 bucks, but they fixed it. And then we mowed the lawn once and put the lawnmower away. A couple weeks after that, we got the lawnmower out again. I should say, that's the royal we, right? That was my son who got the lawnmower out. And uh, then next thing I know, he comes into the house. Dad, it won't start. I'm going, what are you talking about? I spent 120 bucks. It'll start. And I went out there. And lo and behold, the thing wouldn't start. It just wouldn't start at all. Took it back to the lawnmower repair place. And a few days later, they called me, and and I went in, and they said, hey, listen, we're going to only charge you for the part, but we really don't think this is our issue. And then they asked me a question. They said, "Uh, when's the last time you put gas in the tank that you used to put into this mower? And I said, oh, I don't know, a year ago, year and a half? 
and they shook their head like this. Both of the guys were just shaking their head, and they said, sir, gasoline, it only has a, a life of 30 to 45 days, and if you take year-old gas and put it in there, you're basically putting something almost like glue into that engine. That's why this mower wouldn't work again, is you've gummed up the carburetor with your stale old gas. And you know what I feel like? I feel like for some of us, our, our spirituality maybe even take it a step further, our religion has become like stale old gas. And we're wondering, well, why do I feel so spiritually dull? Why am I not alert to what the enemy is doing? Maybe it's because you got stale spiritual gas. And it's time now to get something fresh. And at the end of this message today, I'm going to show you a little bit more about what that could look like. But it's crucial that we would do this so that the flow of the power of God could be moving freely through our lives. In order to resist that enemy, the devil, we will need the power of God to be flowing freely through our lives. And so maybe it's time to change out the gas, change out that whatever is stale, change it out so that the power and love of God can flow uh, freely in and through your life. The resistance, the resistance starts with the raising up of Jesus and the rising up of those who have been raised up with Jesus. Let me say that again. The resistance starts with the raising up of Jesus and the rising up of those who have been raised up with Jesus. So the scripture we just read, it said, resist him, standing firm in your faith. And I asked you to make this statement personal and say that verse like this, I will resist him, standing firm in the faith. And there's something about this. You and I will be challenged as to whether we'll do this or not. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. And, and what that is about is it's about our faith in Jesus. And you and I need to be those who would stand firm in our faith, firm in our faith that Jesus has paid the price for our sins. So you can't attack me with that and the guilt over that. Standing firm in our faith in Jesus, that Jesus has given me the gift of eternal salvation. So you can't threaten me with hell. Standing firm in our faith in Jesus, that Jesus had said to me, you're worth saving, son. So devil, you can't threaten me with worthlessness, that Jesus has said to me, to me, all things are possible, so you can't threaten me with how this will never work because my Lord is accomplishing something far more than I could ever ask or imagine. Standing firm in our faith is what this moment calls for. If we're going to be resisting the devil, it's not just in our own strength. It's not just going, Argh. it's going, Jesus, my faith is in you. My faith is in what you've done for me. My faith is in your victory. My faith is in the fact that you have conquered the grave. My faith is in the fact that you have opened the way to heaven. My faith is in the fact that you have called me to live with the culture of heaven here on earth. My faith is in the fact that you have given me the power of your Holy Spirit so that I can stand even when I feel weak. This is what it means to stand firm in your faith, to be eyes on Jesus, even in the middle of a storm, walking on top of it, even while the waves are raging. This is what you and I are made for, standing firm in our faith in Jesus. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Jesus and just remind you of what God's word says. In Ephesians chapter two, it says this, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Now, I need for you to understand what you just read and let it hit your heart that God did something through Jesus for you that has absolutely changed where you are. And that God has raised you up. This is a prophetic statement. It's declaring the prophetic reality. That means it's something that is eternally true and that we are able to experience more and more of the reality of 
in real time, here and now. That God has raised us from the dead. This vantage point, If we can understand this, that God has raised us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, if you could understand this, this vantage point changes the whole prospect of spiritual warfare. And so it's no longer a matter of, you know, wondering about how in the world we're going to deal with this terrible, huge, scary evil. But instead, when you start from where you are, you realize where you are is seated in heavenly places. And when you're seated in heavenly places and looking at spiritual warfare from that vantage point, you realize from the get-go that you have the ultimate upper hand and it is the hand of God backing you up, pulling for you and pulling you through. I've been raised up with Jesus so I can and will Resist the devil. Let let me get get you to look at verse 6 again. It said, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. I want you to read that with me. Say it. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. I didn't hear you. I know that you're at home, but I want to make sure you fill your house or your car or your living room with the word of God. Say it out loud with me. Go. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. There's no asterisk in your Bible that says, "Eh, except for you, because look what you did. (laughs) None of it. It's just simply a dick declared statement about what is true. And you might have people around you that don't think you're this or don't think you're that, but God says, yeah, but I do. I think you're worth me raising you up and seating you in heavenly places. I think you're worth me putting my power upon you so that you can rise with me and live into this victory that I've provided for you. I've been raised up with Jesus. So so this weekend is what some uh, would call Pentecost weekend. And that is, a, uh, that is uh, something that comes from a historical origin that dates back to before the church even began. The Jewish people celebrated Passover and then 50 days later celebrated a festival to mark God giving his word and bringing his presence and deliverance. And then Jesus invited his own disciples to celebrate that festival. And then the disciples, because they knew themselves as part of the Jewish community, were ready to celebrate Pentecost, and then something happened. This is after Jesus was raised from the dead, but had not yet ascended. And then when he ascended, this is what what happened next. In Acts chapter 2, it said, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. You know, you you might think, why did you have to read through that whole list of all of these obscure different languages? Because those 15 languages from that point on the map in ancient Israel represented every direction across the entire globe. And the result of Pentecost was people being so full of the Spirit of God that they went out into the world and had a new voice that maybe they didn't even have before, and it was a voice that was empowered by God to tell what God had done, to declare the glory of the gospel of Jesus. And so this is Pentecost weekend, and I hope that that we experience all of it, all of it, that right now 
you would experience in these next few minutes the power of God in your home. And the scripture describes that as something like a mighty rushing wind. Now, we can't fabricate that, nor would we ever want to. But when the power of God comes, sometimes phenomenal things happen, things that are a phenomenon. And like the mighty rushing wind, like the tongues of fire, something unexplainable in human terms that was simply miraculous. And I have been praying like crazy that right where you are, right now, there would begin to be a movement of the Holy Spirit that would come upon you and it would change you. And, and I'm not looking just that you would have a moment with some goosebumps and chills. That's not what the purpose is. The, the end is that you would be so empowered by the Spirit of God that you would rush into this world with the power of God to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ and how good God is and what God has done. This is what you're made for. But you've got to say, yes, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Burn away whatever needs burning away from my life. Take me to the place where I'm so full of your spirit that there's less and less and less of, of the flesh getting the better of me. And God, would you give me the boldness like those disciples had, empowered by your spirit, to be declaring Jesus. <laughs> and it does say that they spoke to people. This is different than praying in tongues. They were speaking in tongues. And yes, they were speaking in languages they never even knew before. Miraculously, amazing. God can do anything, and he can do that. I'm praying that God would give you some kind of a new voice, a new boldness, a new witness, a new willingness to say, yes, Jesus, I will say who you are to the world around me. I will be a legit follower of Jesus, not just a, not just a passive one, but an activated one who is going to bring the glory of God wherever I can, however I can. But it starts with knowing Jesus. So let's start there. Maybe you're watching and you're engaging today online and this is kind of new for you. <laughs> At the heart of it is Jesus, the Son of God, has come into this world to take away the sins of humanity. But what that really means is to take away my sin, your sin, and to pay the price for it. And when you see the cross and images of the cross, what you're looking at is a demonstration of God's great love. Because Jesus went to the cross as the perfect sacrifice, the one and only one who could be the perfect sacrifice, to take away the sin, to pay the price for my sin and yours, so that one day I could wake up and, and say, I get it, I can't fix myself, I need your forgiveness, would you forgive me? And he forgives because he's paid the price so that forgiveness could flow. And so maybe what you need to do right now, if this is new for you, is once and for all, once and for all, cry out and say, Jesus, will you forgive me and save me? Ask him to do it. Ask him to forgive you and to save you. And then maybe confess. Confess that you are a sinner who needs to be forgiven. And say, I, I confess my sin and I turn from it now, Jesus. And Jesus, I'm turning to you. I'm asking you to forgive me and save me. Jesus, would you be the Lord of my life from this moment on? Just start right there. If you've never done this before, do it now. And if you're with us in Facebook, put in the comments, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Just write that so that we can follow up with you. If you're on our church online platform, just click the button that says you're committing your life to Jesus. We want to help you walk in this new relationship with strength and power. And uh, it's a journey that all of us are on. And we want to be on it together. We want you to be on it together with us. So why don't you, if you haven't yet, I want you to pray with me, those of you for whom this is new, and just pray right now and simply start by saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin right now. And Jesus, I turn to you. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking, Lord, that you would give me the gift of eternal life. Just say it to him, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you paid the price for my sin when you died on the cross. Just say it to him, Jesus, I believe that you conquered death and that you rose from the dead and you're alive. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and be my Lord, my Savior from this moment on. Jesus, I'm yours. Just say it to him, Jesus, I'm yours. Just say it again, Jesus, I'm yours. And for somebody right now, everything is just beginning. It's like you're being born again in this very moment because you've given your life to Jesus. Let us walk with you on this journey. But for somebody else, it's time now for more of the fullness of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Right in this moment, Holy Spirit, come. And somebody right now where you're sitting, 
Or if you're standing up, just say it with me. Holy Spirit, come. Just say it a few times out loud. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just say it again. Holy Spirit, come. Don't you want to experience something like what we read about from the Bible today? Tongues of fire, mighty rushing wind. Do you want to settle for everything being boxy and controllable? Or do you want to step into the uncontrollable, massively amazing power and love of God? Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just say it again. Holy Spirit, come. Just, just call out to him. Holy Spirit, come. and Move in my life. Holy Spirit, come. Activate the power of your spirit in me in a new way. Just say it again. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just say it again. Lean in in this moment. It's too easy to just decide, oh, it's the end of church now. I'm going to get ready to click off. Get ready to dive in deeper. Right now, begin to lean up. Sit up in your chair. Maybe even stand up and raise your hands. And for a moment, a moment, just give more of yourself to the Spirit of God. And say in this moment, Holy Spirit, come. Come into my life. Bring fresh power into my life. Just step into it deeper right now. Holy Spirit, come and move in a way that would bring freedom. I've been bound. I've been locked down by this and that and something else. And I need your freedom. Just say it. Holy Spirit, come. Just cry out to him right in this moment. With me, say it. Holy Spirit, come. Break off the chains off of my life. Break off the chains off of my family. Break off the chains. I don't want my kids to inherit a legacy of this kind of depression, this kind of heaviness, this kind of evil, this kind of darkness. No. Instead, I want the Spirit of God blowing into my life and through my life. Say it again. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and bring the refreshing. Holy Spirit, would you come and bring the renewing. Holy Spirit, come. Would you bring the power that I need to rise up in this moment. Holy Spirit, come and give me the victory over the evil one. Holy Spirit, come and show me how I'm supposed to move forward. Say it again. Holy Spirit, come and show us how to bring empathy and healing into this world that's divided by the racism and injustice and the evil that we see all around us. Holy Spirit, come. Come on and lift your voice. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Oh, if I could hear the music, I'd start singing. But Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just cry out in this moment. Holy Spirit, come. Lean in. You need him more than you know. And he's willing more than you know. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. I want you guys to just begin singing. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come like a mighty rushing wind. Come like fire in this moment. Move in power in our homes. Holy Spirit, Pentecost. Pentecost, right now, Holy tongues Spirit of fire, come. bringing revelation, bringing an excitement the about Holy life with Spirit Jesus, come. bringing back the sense of adventure and fullness of Holy following Spirit Jesus. Come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Bring Spirit your power come. to bear upon our lives. Shine through our lives. Holy Burn Spirit away the flesh come. from off of our lives. Give us, God, revelation Holy about who you really are. Bring us, God, to a place where we would be in unity with the body of Christ, willing to stand arm in arm, loving one another well, bringing a witness to this world like those disciples did after they left that house where they were shaken by your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. We're going to lift our voice, God. We're going to lift our voice to you, God. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come.